Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to those who are here and the, those who are joining us online. Um, reinventing the single market. Uh, it is a really great pleasure to have as our guest of honor today, former Prime Minister of Italy, Enrico Letta, who has been tasked, as you know, with a report on the single market to be produced uh, in March, which uh, is a very short period of time to consult all the member states and different people in the member states and come up with, with his report. Uh, so he is going to talk us through some of the things he's thinking about in terms of the, this, this report on the single market and making it more efficient. Um, Enrico is going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, we have two uh, respondents from the world of business and from the world of academia. Uh, Russell Grandinetti, who's the Senior Vice President for International Stores at Amazon, one of the uh, Amazon's most senior executives, and Bridget Laffner, who's now the Chancellor uh, of University of Limerick, and I think it's fair to say one of the world's leading uh, scholars on European integration. So we'll get their perspectives on the single market and changes that are needed to make it better functioning after uh, the address. Also, I'd like to say that the event today is in cooperation with Amazon. Um, so with that, uh, I think we've got a lot to discuss and there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you back. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to have this opportunity. And if you allow me, I would like to use this opportunity, maybe to raise questions and then to have your answers, because I'm in a, first of all, in a listening mood in this period in preparation of this report. This is why I'm uh, uh, having a, uh, a tour d'Europe, uh, 27 countries. It's not easy. I can uh, assure you, but for me it's uh, it's fantastic and fascinating being here. I had meetings at the tea shop department this morning um, and with stakeholders, and it's fascinating being here with old friends uh, and new friends. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity. I start by saying that the single market we just had the the thirtieth anniversary of the single market. Uh, 30 years ago, when uh, Jacques Delors uh, launched the single market, uh, we were in a completely different world. And uh, I would like to start by underlining this point that is uh, crucial. In a completely different world. And uh, this completely different world has uh, today, uh, in, the, in comparison, uh, some continuities and some big changes. And I would like to stress the changes, and the changes are for me uh, very important. First of all, that the, the the launch of the single market happened when the European Union was at 12. It is always very important to remind that uh, now we are 27, and we will be soon, I think, 35. And uh, the same single market rules, uh, 12, uh, 27, 35, I think this is the first uh, key and the first problem because the single market was created in a completely different uh, European uh, uh, Union. But the single market was created in a different world, if I may say, in a different world in terms of uh, uh, what was the world around us. And the world around us was completely different at that time. When we started, we were in the period in which Giscard d'Estaing and Schmitt uh, invented the G7, and the G7 had four out of seven uh, European uh, Union uh, member states, or European community at that time member states. The world of today is a world where uh, the dimension is completely different, and we as Europeans, we have to understand that uh, uh, only altogether we can be able to be at the level of discussions with the big giants of the world of today. Uh, India wasn't there uh, 30 years ago. China wasn't there 30 years ago. The BRICS weren't there 30 years ago. Indonesia wasn't there 30 years ago. Uh, Vietnam, uh, South Africa, Brazil, I think it is very important when, to, to start from this point, because at the end of the day, I think they asked me to uh, present a report on that precisely 
because the single market at the very beginning was an exercise very much inward looking in a positive terms. We use the term uh, inward looking in negative terms. In that uh, field, I think we have to consider that it was a very inward looking uh, exercise. The idea was the competition is among the member states. So we have to uh, regulate the competition among the member states and we have to create the uh, level playing field among the member states. And so all the rules of the single market and all the uh, uh, completion uh, uh, journey for the single market was considered as a very internal affair of the European Union. And this is the main uh, difference today, because when I uh, discuss with people, when I think what will be the future of the single market, I start by saying the single market will be both an internal and an external affair of the European uh, Union. And that is, in my view, the main big change and the main big challenge. Because in, the, in reality, the single market didn't have the tools, the behaviors, the vocabulary, the wording on being an external uh, tool. Uh, we had it as an internal uh, uh, European Union affair. And, uh, and so my first point I would like to, to share with you it is exactly that. How can we have an internal market, a, a single market, uh, with the idea, and with not just the idea, but maybe something more than an idea, with the, the mission to consider it as part of the way in which the European Union considers the ro his role uh, at world level. Uh, knowing that the role of the single market in relationship with the rest of the world is crucial, has to be crucial. And this is why in my exercise, I will visit all the member states, but I'm planning also to be in the US, to be in London, to be in Oslo, for instance, but also to have discussions with uh, the candidate countries for the enlargement, the next enlargement of the European Union and many other uh, potential partners, because the single market is more and more a tool for the external dimension of the European integration. This is my first point, and uh, this point has consequences. Uh, I would like uh, Dan to mix always in my introduction um, the, the, the big picture and, and some details. Uh, because the big picture has consequences on details. For instance, this point about internal and external and has an immediate consequence on the competition rules. Competition rules uh, for a single market inward looking are competition rules where the only problem is to fragment, is to cut, is to avoid mergers, is to uh, be able to... Uh, avoid uh, concentrations because the relevant market is the European one or the national one. But if we consider the single market as a tool of a global perspective of the European integration, then the first big consequence is that you have to change your mind on the competition policy. The competition policy has to consider that the relevant market is not only the national one or the European one. On some issues, the relevant market becomes the global one. Ask you to uh, give a look to the telecom market, which is, in my view, the most interesting one on this uh, field. Uh, the, in the 90s, the European companies were the center of the world, if I may say. And our uh, European Union was the place where the technological revolutions were uh, starting. GSM, for instance. Ericsson and Nokia are 
the, the outcome of these two revolutions. And they are today still the big brands of Europe in uh, the telecom world because of the success of this uh, technological revolution. But today, with the competition policy we had, so relevant market, the national one, or the European one, but mostly the national one, we have a situation that, uh, in comparison with China and the US, brings Europe in a, a very, I would say, small mode. Uh, the average of the clients for uh, one of the Chinese operators is 402 zero, so uh, 420 uh, million uh, clients. Uh, the average of clients for uh, a US operator is 110 million, and the average clients for a European operator is 4.4 million. It is clear that uh, there's no comparison feasible and uh, and this is the first uh, uh, point and the first outcome I wanted to uh, share with you. So internal dimension versus external dimension. The external dimension today is becoming bigger and bigger. And when I say external dimension, also I make another uh, a link with the trade policies, another outcome on that in the past, the external trade policy 30 years ago, 20 years ago, was, I have to say, just a, a sort of continuation or uh, evolution uh, of our internal uh, uh, policy on, on trade. And the problem was just for the others, not for us, because at the end of the day, to have an agreement with a third country far away smaller than uh, really smaller than us was not a big point for us uh, today we need to reopen a completely different strategy on uh, foreign trade because we are becoming more and more isolated at the world level and trade is part of this isolation uh, i say that because we were shocked in the last months when the list of the countries uh, following and uh, following us at the UN level, for instance, on uh, the decisions on uh, uh, on uh, Ukraine against Russia and so on, was a, a, a list of countries not so large, with many countries, mostly in Africa or in Latin America, not following us, and we were surprised. But I think, partially, the way in which they look at us, they, the way in which they think that we are, again, the idea of the Europe fortress, uh, without any will to have with them uh, cooperation on the most important part for them, that is trade, uh, is part of the problem. And I think there's part of our approach that, that has to be uh, changed uh, on that, because we need to consider uh, you will see my thoughts, are they have a fil rouge, and the fil rouge is the uh, changing dimension. And, and we were the center of the world in terms of dimensions, and we are not. Uh, and so we have to adjust because of that. But, and this is my second point, it is not just a question of dimensions for a very simple reason. There's another part of the world like us, with the same dimensions, uh, with similar demographic situation, better than us, but not uh, enormously different from us, that is having a different trend of competitiveness. That is, of course, the US. So we had, and we have, a problem of competitiveness in relationship with the US. And this is partially because uh, our integration uh, had a slowdown in the last years. Uh, there are studies that are calculating that the 
intra-US states trade is four times average more than the intra-EU member states trade four times. Uh, it, it's big for time, <laughs> if I may say. It's very big. It's the demonstration that we are far from the or being the United States of Europe, even if we are in the single market. So we are in a uh, in a in a space, in a framework where we decided to eliminate barriers, we do to eliminate borders. So uh, the second big point is the fact that uh, dimension is not, I would say, uh, a death sanction, uh, is, is not the end. Dimension is a problem, but we can win even with a dimension that is not the dimension of 30 years ago. The US are showing that it's possible. Why uh, we are so in difficulty? And I have to say, to this topic, my answer is because of fragmentation, because of uh, what we are losing because of the lack of unity. There was at the very beginning of the single market process, uh, uh, famous, famous for students like me at that time, uh, report that was the famous Cecchini report, the report of the cost of the non-euro. And it was fantastic, this report. And this report, I think the method, we have to use it today uh, because it is exactly the same. Uh, the losses that we are having because we are fragmented are uh, losses that uh, are uh, today the big problem of competitiveness. And I would like to add that uh, the lack of unity and the fragmentation is for many reasons a political uh, a point of political will it is not just a problem of uh, details or technical details sometimes the single market was conceived as a problem of details how to put the screwdriver in the right way uh, i always had with discussions with jack delor on that because he was the one who invented uh, the idea to to i would say to combine soul and screwdriver. And I like this combination because it's, it's a very intelligent way to, to know how to put the screwdriver, screwdriver, but at the same time where to put the values. But today, if I have to say, yes, there's a problem of screwdriver, but there's a political problem that is most important, the most important one. And the political problem is the fact that we are at the moment in which we have to understand that sharing our national flags is a must, is a plus. And on many fields, we don't consider that this is the uh, must. And we prefer to have our national flag. And we prefer to have an incumbent on telecom, on energy, on the banking system, uh, with our national flag, even if, even if this incumbent is decreasing. And we need to help him to stay and, and to stand, uh, but he is decreasing. And it is clear that it's necessary to have a merger with another incumbent to become uh, able to, uh, to deal with the big players at what level. Uh, and uh, I always use the example of Airbus, Airbus is there. It's a great positive example. And Airbus is the demonstration of what the European uh, Union can do, what the Europeans can do. And Airbus today is the giant on uh, his sector uh, fighting with Boeing. But Airbus was and is there because of uh, a fight, a political fight. And the problems were political problems, not uh, technical problems. And so this is the, the other big part of the problem, the dimension, how to scale up, how to have on many issues, the possibility to uh, scale up. But I have to say that the single market is more than that. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to say that here in Dublin, because the, the, the Brexit issue uh, was 
they're showing us showing us as the single market is uh, more than than that. The single market here is, was the demonstration of the European solidarity mood. The single market was the demonstration of how Europe is able, with his solidarity, uh, to help uh, not only the big countries but also the small countries in a mortal combat, uh, if I may say, on some uh, very crucial issues. And on the single market, we discovered the importance of being together. And I always use the example of one country, a rich country, a rich country uh, that each year, Christmas, they uh, pay a check to all of us, to the European uh, uh, Union, and they pay a check to be part of the single market without being part of the European Union and without uh, attending the meetings where we take decisions on how to rule the single market. And this, this country is Norway, of course, and is the demonstration of the importance of the single market. Norway is a rich country, but they want to stay because they know how the single market is important. And they even paying without attending meetings on how to rule. Uh, and they are part of that. I think it's the best example to understand the strength uh, of the single market, how the single market is important. I have to say that, and this is my second part, uh, and my uh, I go to the conclusions, um, the single market can't be just that, and can't be just how to overcome barriers, how to eliminate borders. It is the core, but there are today two main subjects that are, in my view, decisive uh, for uh, putting energies, for mobilizing energies, and for having a stronger uh, single market and more competitive and uh, more effective single market. The first one is the main uh, mission for the European Union for the next 10 years. Uh, I think in politics, we have to put priorities. I hate those politicians saying that this is the center, but this is the center too, but this is the center, and this is the core, and this is and 12 cores. It's, it's, there's one, number one, then if you say the other one is number two, number three, so politics is, is having a list of priorities. And I think the first priority, and it is an existential choice for the European Union, is to answer the question, who will pay the green transition in Europe in the next 10 years? Because we decided to have the green transition, but we didn't say who will pay it. And if we are not clear on that, and if you don't take decisions on who will pay the green transition, the green transition will fail. And if we fail on the green transition, we fail on the most well-performing part of our European dream. Because if I have to say one topic where we are the number one in the world, uh, this is the green transition. And this is the mission to be uh, in the future sustainable and to be able to change our industrial model uh, through the, the green transition. It is feasible if we plan, not if we only react to crisis, because there's, uh, we, we have to plan. Uh, Jacques Delors, when he launched the single market, he launched the single market in the uh, mid 80s with a plan. And the plan, I think we remember very well, the plan was seven years from 85 to 72, uh, sorry, 92. And the plan was uh, established in the Milan, uh, the council uh, 85 and seven years to get the completion of the single market. And it was a great plan with steps. Of course, he was obliged to adjust this plan because during the seven years, something happened. For instance, the Berlin Wall uh, or uh, the, 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 the end of the, 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 the communism and so on. And then he adjusted it. But he had a plan, 
he had an idea, a vision. And this is what we need today. And for the green transition, we need to have this vision. And the vision has to uh, answer the most important question, who will pay the green transition for the green transition? There are different ways to pay the green transition. One way is to say each member states, okay, uh, each country alone, but it is exactly the opposite of the European Union. Uh, this is why I don't think that state aids uh, driven uh, economic policy can be the solution. State aids can be there only for a crisis, to react to a crisis, not uh, for, for a long-term uh, uh, policy. Uh, we need to have a common European response to that. But this common European response can be effective only if we have uh, the completion of the single market on the financial side. As you know, the, the financial side of the single market is the poorest part. Uh, is the part where the completion is, is the poorest. For many reasons, we were discussing before uh, at the Taoiseach uh, department why there are many, many reasons. I had this very good discussion yesterday with, with the president of the Eurogroup uh, and with the commissioner, uh, two great Irish uh, leaders, uh, why the problem is that it is not completed and because it is not completed completed 2% of gdp of european gdp this is the study of jean pisani ferry that is in my view very interesting uh, he said 2% of the european gdp that is composed by european people savings is flying every year to the us because the financial market of the US is more profitable, more interesting. So our savings are go, going there to reinforce the American uh, economy. And uh, one main point would be to keep this money in Europe for the European financial system, to reinforce the European financial system and to help the European financial system to build up vehicles able to uh, finance the green transition. They are not there. They are not there. Uh, we in Europe, we have the idea that uh, uh, to save money, we have to put money in the banks. Usually this is the approach and it is not the way to finance uh, the, the, the risk, the economy and so on and so forth. So we have to build up a new approach on that. And this is the uh, the, the first big point, the link between single market and the green transition. And I see that as one of the main issues and I would like to share with you or to discuss with you on that. And the second point is about uh, the so-called open strategic autonomy. That is a very interesting uh, terminology, open strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, as we uh, say, uh, President Macron uses European sovereignty uh, the president of the Republic of my country uses shared sovereignty, but the, the topic is the same. Uh, we, we know that our people, I'm sorry to use uh, this term because it disturbed me a, a lot, but uh, our people, they want to take back control of our so sovereignty. Uh, and, and, and I think there's a, a true topic there. Uh, because we are losing sovereignty, we are losing control. Uh, and the only way to, to take back control is doing that at the European level, at the European level, in terms of European sovereignty. This is why the link between completion of the single market and European sovereignty is another key issue. And I'm, I'm very supportive of what Commissioner Thierry Breton is doing. Uh, in the last year, the realizations at European level in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, digital Europe, uh, and many other issues related to that were very important because we, at this level, we can try uh, to take back control uh, if we are able to build up a European sovereignty. But European sovereignty 
uh, of course, means also uh, defense, means energy, means something that until now was very uh, fragmented in Europe because we had defense, energy, topics where the fragmentation was uh, the main topic. I would like to end up then with some po one point that, uh, uh, in my view, maybe is the, and we said, the umbrella of everything. And the point is the following one. The single market is the most important realization. The single market is our strength at world level. Michel Bernier uh, usually says that uh, why Xi Jinping is respecting us, why Donald Trump was obliged to respect us, because we have the single market and they know they are obliged to respect us because of the single market. And he's right, I think. But the single market risks to have one main problem. It is in terms of narrative and in terms of realizations, very, very, I would say, is beloved by the part of our people uh, which are the most mobile part of our people. People uh, traveling, uh, working in another country, speaking other languages with the idea that uh, the single market is an opportunity to move. But there's a large part of our people, they don't want to move. They want to stay. And uh, the single market has to become not only freedom to move, but also freedom to stay. That seems to be a contradiction with what the single market is, but in my view is the only way to relaunch it and to make the single market really attractive uh, to everyone. Because if people think that the single market, the European integration is for only for those who are mobile, I think the European Union will uh, lose uh, his mission. And the mission of the European Union is to be good for all, not only for the mobile part of our society, for the educated part of our society, for the high skills part of our society. This is why a reflection on how to uh, have an evolution of the single market as the freedom to stay uh, is, I think, the most important, probably completion, uh, intellectual completion of the single market. I'm trying to run this exercise uh, in parallel with the exercise that Mario, Mont Mario Draghi is doing uh, on competitiveness in this very open way. Uh, I'm lucky because with Mario Draghi, we have a very good cooperation. So I'm sure that we will coordinate our two reports. I'm lucky also because uh, I'm a great friend of another prime minister of Italy uh, that had uh, the privilege to write a mandate, to write a, a high level report on the single market, Mario Monti in 2010. I have to say it's quite a, a, an Italian job to, to run these kind of exercises. Uh, and uh, I, I am trying to run this, this, this mandate uh, in a very free and open mood. Uh, I'm in a phase of my life in which I have no uh, further political career to do, nothing to lose, uh, but I'm passionate of Europe. I think Europe needs a relaunch in this very moment, and we need at world level a European Union more ambitious and more uh, effective. And I strongly hope that uh, thanks to uh, the collective exercise that here too we are doing on my uh, uh, mandate, on my uh, report, uh, we will be able to help uh, this relaunch of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, Enrico. A lot of issues covered there. I would say before going to our two discussants that the audience here and the much bigger audience online indicate here in the room to me if you want to get a question because we won't have that much time for questions. And those online, please 
put your questions uh, via the Zoom function to as, as, as soon as you can, we'll increase the chances of the question being answered. So without further ado, Bridget, can I pass to you for your thoughts? Yes, indeed. And uh, thank you, Enrico, for, for a, a very uh, inspiring and challenging address on the single market. So I'll make three points. First, the single market was a major EU strategic project in the 1980s into the 1990s. And this project at 30 now needs another phase, but it has to be major and it has to be strategic. Why? Because Europe's decisive power comes from the single market. That market power is the workhorse of European integration at home, but it is also the attraction to the outside world when it comes to trade deals, market access, and the Brussels effect. It is core EU business, and both the state elites in the member states, but also citizens, we need a reminder of the centrality of the single market. And we have the experiment in what happens when you leave the single market. Firstly, it's a drag on your growth and it's a drag on your productivity. And it's not, it doesn't look good for an economy if they leave the single market. So we, we shouldn't need to be reminded, but European citizens do. And I would say Jacques Peltmans captures it perfectly when he says the single market is the anchor for European values, but the magnet for its prosperity. And it's, the, as you said, it's the interaction between uh, these two. Second point, I think it's really important that your mandate came from the European Council and not the Commission. Why do I say that? If there is a centre of political authority in the EU, it is the Council. It's the tasking institution par excellence. Unless the European Council gives the decisive political push to this, then there won't be the the next uh, grand projet when it comes to uh, when it comes to the single market. Uh, and I also think it's important that it's in, in conjunction with the Draghi report on competitiveness because these are the key drivers. Then, what's at stake? I would say that there's probably. There is nothing less than the adaptation of Europe's political economy for the next phase of its development. That's what's at stake. Europe does not have a right to prosperity. It doesn't have a right to global goods or public goods. It has to earn them and take the agency. And that adaptation of the political economy is very complex. It's transversal. It almost covers everything, but we have no uh, we have no choice. And I was very struck by your emphasis all the time on the world outside. And I would say that this is the phase of European integration where the world outside has greater influence on the EU than ever before. I wouldn't argue that in, in the past, the world outside did not matter, but rather that it's the speed and acceleration of the changes and that the world outside is a less comfortable place for Europe today. So that adaptation of the political economy is absolutely crucial. And then in terms of the content, there's the whole area of economic security, Europe's vulnerabilities, uh, infrastructure connectivity, both hard infrastructure, but also digital uh, energy, absolutely huge, and the uh, the digital transition, and all of that underpinned by the need to green uh, to green the economy. So it is transversal, and it's very it, it's 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 big. All of it matters, uh, but as as it, all of it matters, but the prioritization is absolutely crucial. So then the question is, how will it be funded? Uh, and here, I think there's a, a need to think about the balance between public and private power in the EU and public and private power in Europe more generally. The liberal turn in the 1970s and 80s came from the fact that the public had crowded out the private. So we can't go back there. But there is a t there is a space now for public power. You cannot the green economy will not just be done just by the private sector on its own, but it needs the private sector as well. So that how the private and public power interacts and intersects matters. Uh, the role of the the role of the private uh, the role of the private sector, and then finally the question is how to to get there. So the single market had a grand bargain. It had firstly discursive power. 1992 captured the imagination. 
not only did it capture the imagination, but it led to anticipatory change. The minute 85, 86, 87, companies in Europe began to think, this is serious, this will happen, and we better get ready for it. And I remember breaking the lights near Stevens Green one time in uh, about 1880 or 1988, and a guard shouting at me, you won't do that in the, after 1992. So it had captured the popular imagination and not just business and, and the politicians. Then there was a bargain, the treaty change, what was needed in order to get there. And then there was a calendar. It, it, was, it was prosecuted, these, these laws, these laws, these laws, and these laws. And then underpinned by uh, the doubling of the structural funds, which again was very important. So what is the required grand bargain in Europe at this phase in order to pay for the greening of the economy, in order to make sure uh, that Europe responds to the fragmentation? Because of course the single market achieved an awful lot, but economics doesn't stand still, political economy changes. And so it in, in a sense is the adaptation of Europe's political economy. What does fit for 55 mean for Europe? And I think it's a pretty stark choice for Europe because we're going to be a smaller part of the global economy. We're going to be smaller in terms of demography, but we have great strengths and a depth of, of, of uh, social capital. So Europe has a choice. Does it want to go down the tubes in considerable style or does it want to take its future in its own hands. And I think it's as stark as that. Uh, and so it's interesting that both the uh, the soul and the screwdriver are needed again uh, for the next phase of European integration. And I, I think it's really important that the European Council uh, is, is taking this very seriously. And I wish Enrico Letta all the best wishes with your endeavors because it really matters to all of us and to the next generation of Europeans. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bridget. Some stark stuff there. Uh, Ross, over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Dottore Letta, and thank you to the IEA for inviting us. Um, I'm proud to be here on behalf of the 150,000 Amazon employees across Europe that power our business. And um, But I, I have my own in, individual story. I've been, the, I've been at Amazon 26 years. I, I joined the company when we we sold books and we did it in the US. It was a hundred people in a four story office in Seattle. And I was very struck by um, your comments about the level of trade between US states and comparing that to the EU. I think it's incredibly useful. Um, we did not, the hundred, the hundred of us in this four story building did not spend a lot of time thinking about how hard it was to sell in Nebraska and how hard it was to sell in Florida. Um, if I think about the state of our business, and I, I, I don't mean to brag about the scope of our business in Europe, but we are we, we support 125,000 small, medium businesses who sell on Amazon across the single market today. Um, quite proudly, I mean, but over 60% of all the units we sell in Europe are for small and medium businesses. And small and medium businesses are two thirds of the workforce in Europe. And they are made up of the people who stay. Um, uh, we were re reviewing some small businesses in Europe recently. One of them comes to mind as a three generation family run cashmere business in Tuscany by the Dondoni family. They used to make cashmere private label for the, the big brands. And they decided to um, make their own sweaters and sell them directly to customers. And they, they, do, so, they do so on Amazon. This is the classic European business you want to see flourish and for which the single market should be a dream. And yet today, when they sell in each member state across our marketplaces, they have to file VAT in every single country every year. We've actually done a ton of work to file VAT on behalf of the 125,000 Amazon sellers. I believe Amazon might be the largest VAT filer in Europe today. But this is precisely the kind of thing um, I would recommend not only that we think about where Europe needs to go in this next legislative session, this next period of time, next five years from the top down, but if you work up from the bottom of individual businesses and how they can trade and how you can bring about this way of creating the giants of Europe that I 
read about so frequently. Even just to move businesses between, move goods between member states is far more complex today than I think most people perceive. And then if we think about this question of green, another seller we were discussing recently, we have a German seller called NCC Design. They sell lights and lighting products. Um, because of the, I think, incredibly good thought process within Europe to be a leader in helping build a more green economy and a green world, they actually, because their products have some batteries and some other electrical components, they need to file for registration numbers because of the components inside the lighting products they make. To sell all their products outside of Germany where they're based, actually to sell their products on Amazon, they need 16 different registration numbers from 10 different authorities in the three countries in the EU they sell in. It costs them about 5,000 euros per number. It takes about 16 weeks to do. So like this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of removing barriers. And then we have this question of moving things across borders where you know, for that green economy, the kind of charging network, how to actually move trucks across borders. I don't know if it's true that that trucking and transportation looks like um, telecom, but I can tell you from a carrier perspective, that fragmentation, you look at the number of the size of the trucking companies with whom we work across Europe are very small and very fragmented and frequently market, excuse me, member state specific. So if I were bold enough to offer some advice in thinking about important dimensions of this question of how to help the single market achieve its great purpose. And Lord knows you and we have come a long way. Um, uh, when we launched Amazon Germany in October of 1998, our prices were in Deutschmarks. Notwithstanding the existence of the EU, we still didn't have the currency yet. That came a couple of years later. And we've been on this journey to help make Europe competitive, that is very real. So I manage the business in all the countries of the world outside the US. I have to think about where to locate teams and capital in different places in the world. And the fact that when you collect Europe as one economy, it appears second in the world after the US helps me think very quickly about Europe and everything you all and we all can do together to actually make it function that way will let us continue as a Sure, headquartered outside Europe, but nonetheless very much part of the fabric of employment and commerce inside Europe contribute. And I think it will also contribute to the separate goal, which I know the EU has, of allowing European companies not just to grow big within Europe, but give them the capability, having grown here, to then go other places in the world, which I think today may hold them back in some respects. So those are some of the things that came to mind when I heard you talk, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the first question comes from Nancy O'Neill. Uh, she asks about capital markets union. Uh, Enrico, you, you cited the Bizarre Ferries, 2% of all savings, is it, in Europe, end up going to the US, US uh, financial of GDP. Go to, that's a huge figure, it goes to the, to the United States because of the, uh, presumably, the uh, attractiveness of uh, US equity markets. Could you talk a little about how a better uh, financing structures in Europe is, is part of your um, part of your report. Uh, yes, and and she asks also if I am collaborating with with Minister Dono on uh, his Eurogroup CMU uh, workstream uh, project. Yes, my my answer is yes. Uh, we well, I met him yesterday and we decided to cooperate because. Uh, he is supposed to present uh, his paper at the same time in March at the um, uh, European level, and uh, we have the same uh, goals. And so I, I, I think it is very important to uh, to work in the same in the same direction. I um, the the main problem is the fact that at the European level we had until now on CMU, on the Capital Markets Union, uh, a long list of important things to do. You have an action plan uh, launched by the Commission. Everything is, is very, very well. I, I think uh, all the different, I don't remember if 17 or 18 uh, action needed are well. The point is that we didn't understand until now at the European level, which is the declic, where is the declic? 
where is the the turning point where you can start having uh, an increase and until now it doesn't work our countries are countries where um, savings are going to, to the banks we don't have fen pension funds uh, we have a very conservative and very stability driven approach on that uh, and so at the end of the day we don't have the possibility to there's a fragmentation there's a fragmentation in the capital market system you have we have 27 authorities 27 supervisors at european level and this is another part of the problem uh, and uh, we have uh, many uh, stock exchanges and the fragmentation is part of the problem so yes we will work on that and i hope with dono we will find some ideas on how to relaunch it in my view it is crucial to put political pressure uh, because it partially is a, is a political problem in many ways, I suppose, since the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, Europe has actually gone the other way in mm -hmm. terms of integrating its mm -hmm. capital markets. It's made to, to a considerable extent have gone gone the other way. There's a question here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's working, yeah. I'm, I'm Fergal McNamara, and I chair the Energy and Climate Group here at the Institute, and I'm an energy specialist in my day job. And it's about the green transition. Uh, when, the mar when the single market opened in the early 90s, it did not include energy. It took it has taken till now before we're getting what's looking like a single electricity, a single energy market across Europe. But the Lisbon Treaty still has uh, member state competencies about energy security. And I suppose the point about that is uh, that will determine the pace of the green transition that you mentioned, as well as the discussion you just had on the capital markets union and the banking union. Uh, Five percent of EU GDP is going to be needed to uh, just on the investment side to make the energy transition work. And the pace of the energy transition is clearly uh, related to our overall competitiveness with our trading partners. So so I just, I just, I'm, I'm just asking that question, how you would bring in the new single market that we've been talking about, those three sectors together, the energy sector for the green transition, the capital markets union for the financing and the banking union to make, to make all those three work in a single uh, European integrated market. Thank you, Dan. I have to say that on energy union, we paid the cost of the fact that in the past, energy was the first part of the single market that was eliminated from the table uh, for a very simple reason, because when Jacques Delors started by saying that we will have the single market and the single market will be a tout azimut, as the French say, uh, then uh, the member states said yes, and the member states, the 12, not Orban, uh, just to be clear, the 12, they said yes, but then they started to say yes, but uh, energy, how can we have energy altogether? Each country has its own strategic interests and so on, and so no energy. Uh, telecom, telecom is strategic, it's a national. Uh, uh, it's, it's a question of national uh, strategic interest, so no telecom. And then, so we continue with the, with with the long list, and so at the end of the day, maybe it's it's fifty or sixty percent of the entire single market that is what we today name single market, because of many of of that. So, I think on energy, the main problem is: uh, are we able? Uh, I would say, to converge in terms of uh, energy policies or not. Otherwise, it would be complicated to have uh, uh, an energy single market truly effective. Uh, because today there's a, such a different, uh, uh, I would say, uh, situation that you know better than I do in all the different 27 countries. And we understood that we need to be um, self-sufficient. Uh, we can't continue in a situation in which uh, each country has his own policy, depending on uh, third countries, uh, non-European countries, and so on. So uh, it, it is one of the most complicated issues because of the moment in which we are living in. But maybe it is also the moment can be also a, a push, can be also a pressure. Uh, 
Uh, and we know very well that to get difficult political decisions, we need an external pressure. So I'm worried, but at the same time, the political external pressure can uh, uh, can uh, can help in some way. And I would be more than happy if you have ideas on that or here at the Institute, if you elaborate ideas, uh, I'll buy. Okay. okay, time for just one more. We have a hard stop at two. A quick one. Thank you very much, Francis Jacobs. Um, two two quick questions. One is on the extra, the internal and external aspect of the single market. And I always remember Mario Monti arguing that single market was much better than internal market as a name because it reflected these two aspects. Um, how do you? If you have to look at Europe in a broader competitive world world framework, how do you make sure that there are new distortions within the European Union between the centre and the periphery and between the large and smaller member states if you revisit state aids? And my second question, very, very brief, is I was very struck by your phrase for freedom to stay. And um, how do you think that that can be implemented within the European Union. Presumably there's a social dimension. There are all kinds of, of dimensions, but I'd love to know your ideas on how you think that could be improved. Certainly the first one too. Now on the second, I think that there are so many topics. Uh, services of general interest is part of the, of the problem because we are having a, a big cleavage between those living in big cities when you have hospitals, when you have centers, services, and those who are living in the rural areas where you don't have all these uh, facilities. And uh, I, maybe I was real, I, I, um, I used to live in France during the period of the Gilets Jaunes. And for me, it, ça me travaille beaucoup. Uh, it was a, a very interesting experience being there in that period because the topics are the same that we are living in, uh, we are, we're experiencing in Italy, in Spain, and I'm sure that here too. Uh, and at the end of the day, Brexit was also something not so far uh, from uh, uh, this topic. So it's uh, on uh, state aids, uh, small and big countries. I think um, the, the key point is that we need to have uh, uh, a European facility uh, to avoid national state aids, a European, a European fiscal capacity uh, and uh, a mix between public and private. And if, uh, as Bridget just said, if we are able to do so, we can avoid uh, state aids. Otherwise, the push from the very center of the industrial capacity of the biggest countries will be too strong uh, to be, I would say, stopped uh, by the small member states at the European level. This is my guess, because when you have the German automotive industry uh, arriving there and saying that uh, if we continue like that, we will uh, destroy not only our industry, but also the Italian one, the Spanish one, the Romanian one, because you have all the supply chain that are connected, uh, it is very difficult to say no. Uh, this is why we need to have the alternative. But the alternative is also through what we discussed today. Right. Thank you. Good. We've just gone over after uh, uh, after two o'clock. Uh, could I thank Bridget, uh, Russ and his colleagues? And most of all, our guest, uh, speak, guest of honor today. I'd just like to say that Enrico was extremely kind of the very uh, first weeks of the pandemic to be one of our first speakers uh, uh, on webinar. And given the huge job you have and the need to visit all the 27 member states, uh, we're particularly grateful that you've given us uh, your time this afternoon. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.